All right, go ahead. Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Kent Branch, April 2023 educational presentation. My name is Cindy Robichaux and I am part of the Kent Branch operating team and your host for this evening. Thank you for joining us. We do have a couple housekeeping items before we begin. Our presentations are recorded and available on our Kent Branch YouTube channel, which is open to everyone. Your microphones and cameras have been turned off, but we welcome your questions. If you hover your mouse near the bottom of the screen, you will see the bar with the chat icon. If you click on it, the chat box will open. Click on the little arrow beside the word everyone and choose the word questions or Angela. Here you can type your questions or message for us or the speaker, and Angela Churchill is monitoring the chat, so thank you, Angela. And before we begin tonight's presentation, Bob Daly, a member of the Lenape Nation and a Kent Branch member, offers a territory acknowledgement. Let me get the button. The land on which we gather, learn, and play is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lunapawak, and Potawatomi peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nations of this area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, the Caldwell First Nation, Chippewa of Kettle and Stony Point, Oneida Nation of the Thames, the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town, the Muncie Delaware Nation, and Wapool Island First Nation. Additionally, there is a growing urban indigenous population who make the cities of southwestern Ontario home. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. Great, thank you, Bob. Okay, so let's get started. For anyone joining us for the first time, let me tell you a bit about Ontario Ancestors. Ontario Ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society, is a non-profit profit registered charity, which was founded in 1961. It is the largest genealogical society in Canada with a mission to encourage, bring together, and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. Be sure to visit the website, to learn more about the resources and support available to assist in your family history research. Ontario Ancestors has over 30 branches and several special interest groups all across Ontario. And we are the Kent branch. We focus mainly on Kent County research and family history. We offer mentoring and education and assistance. We hold, host monthly presentations such as this one, and we have a fantastic family history resource library. Our Family History Library is located on the second floor of the Chatham-Kent Public Library in Chatham. It holds, holds over 45 years worth of historical and genealogical resources for Chatham-Kent. We are open to the public on Fridays and Saturdays from 1 to 5 p.m. and we try to accommodate other times by appointment. Uh, you sure know it's springtime because our Family History Library has been super busy the past few weeks, and we are very glad that so many people are out and about visiting us again. We always like to connect with people interested in genealogy and local history. You can connect with us at this email. You can also join our Kent Branch Facebook group, which has over 750 people who are interested in genealogy and Chatham-Kent history. We also have a very comprehensive website with lots of resources for both our branch members, but also for the general public. In 2023, we'll see the Kent branch turn 45 years old. Uh, we are so proud that the Kent branch has promoted family history, assisted researchers, and provided many services to our community for 45 years. We are hoping to work on having a little special social event to celebrate later this year, so we'll keep you posted on that. So what else is new at the Kent Branch? As always, we are busy working behind the scenes to preserve material and make it accessible. 
Over the past few months, our branch volunteer, Janet, has been spending a great deal of time looking through the local newspaper microfilms, collecting articles on the local century farms. These articles are a gold mine of historical and genealogical information about the families who established these farms and their descendants. A new category has been created in our virtual members library to ar archive these century farms, as well as other farming and agricultural material that we had in our collection. So if you're a member of the branch and you want to know more about these resources, check out the new category. Uh, if you're not a member of the branch, but you want to learn more, just send us an email and we can tell you more about access to these. And of course, we are still busy scanning with our community scanning services. Last month, we visited a family home to scan their family history collection. There were photos and documents and letters and postcards and certificates, etc. That, that we scanned for the family. When the scanning is complete, we will give the family a USB with all their material digitized for them. Their collection will not only be preserved, but it will be in a format that is easily shared with their family members. This was very important to them. We offer this service free of charge and would like to speak with anyone who else is interested in having their own collection of material scanned. Again, just email us at kent at ogs.on.ca to learn more. Now for our upcoming events. Please mark your calendars for our upcoming May educational presentation. On May 12th, we will be back in person at the McKinley Reception Center, which is on St. Clair Street in Chatham. Lisa Gilbert from the Kent Historical Society will discuss how to identify time periods from your ancestors' clothing and fashion in photographs. The presentation is free and it's open to anyone. So join us for this presentation and some much missed socializing and snacks. Be sure to bring a friend. Details will be posted on our website and our Facebook group. For June, July, and August, we take a break from our monthly presentations, but we are back online on September the 8th at 7 p.m. with a representative from Family Search to discuss where to find Ontario land records on the Family Search website. So that'll be very interesting because I know I have a hard time finding all that on their website. So I'm looking forward to that one. Then in Oct on October 13th at 7 p.m., Pastor Mike Skillings will join us online again to discuss the various church histories of the South Buxton and the Romney Pastoral Charge. Then to wrap up the year, we have planned another road trip to Blenheim to tour the Blenheim Freedom Library and Military Museum, and that will happen on Saturday, November 4th. Details are still coming, um, and, but look, mark all these things on your calendar, and we hope you can join us and look forward to all the upcoming events that will, the information will be on our website, and we'll be posting it on our Facebook group and sending it out in our monthly um, uh, communication. So now let's get to tonight's presentation. We are very pre pleased to have local historian and friend of Kent Branch, Henry Van Heeren, joining us. Henry, who was raised in Blenheim, moved to Wallaceburg in 1980, the same year he married. He worked as an electrician from 1979 until 2007. Henry became involved in the Wallaceburg Historical Society in 2017 and became the president in 2021. Henry has created a database to list all of the internments in the Wallaceburg Cemetery, and he's currently working on digitizing the newspaper microfiche collection at the Wallaceburg Library. A lot of work. <laughs> he is also interested in old buildings and local history. Henry has graciously shared much of this information and his database with the Kent branch, for which we are very grateful. So let's give Henry a warm virtual welcome. Henry, welcome, and thank you for joining it. Joining us, we'll turn it over to you now. Okay, am I on there, Cindy? You're on, you just need to share your screen. Okay, uh, I'm new at this, so... Uh, no problem. Please bear with me. And there we go. There you go. 
Okay, well, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to do this, uh, Cindy. Uh, this is actually uh, my first presentation, so I'm going to be a little uh, jumpy with it. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll get through this and uh, I'll have answered a lot of your questions about the, the Baldoon settlement. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, jump in as I will create little pauses here and there to, uh, to find out if anybody has any questions. Uh, so let's uh, begin. Um, excuse me. Uh, so our presentation today uh, is a story that many of you have likely heard in one form or another. Uh, it is about the arrival of a group of hit, uh, Scottish Highlanders that were brought over by Lord Selkirk. But as I go over the details of why they left their homes and made this journey, try to see it through their eyes realizing that these were different times over 200 years ago. There were no cars or trains or cruise ships to get them from here to there. Travel across land was done by walking or by horseback or wagon. Information by, was, or information was, uh, sent over by messenger or information by messenger or letter had to travel the same way and often took weeks or months to reach the recipient. There was no such thing as phones or even telegraph at that time. Most farmers did not own their land in Scotland and but worked farms owned by the English crown or Scottish noblemen. In the early years in Scotland, much of the land was farmed by clans, but owned by noblemen. The clans were allowed to farm the land, but paid taxes to the landowners and to the reigning king. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the wool industry was taking hold and land was needed for the huge flocks of sheep needed to supply the growing number of mills. The king decided that the land could be more profitably used if the clans were told to leave. This way, the land could be used as pastures for the growing wool industry. New laws were introduced that banned the Clark clan tartans and the teaching of the Gaelic culture and language. The Scottish clans were told that they must submit to English rule and would have to surrender their birthright. In other words, it was the English way or the highway. And that is what the nobleman and the king was hoping to, to do, was to chase these people off of their land legally uh, by having them move out because of the, uh, the new laws and rules. Uh, where'd my mouse go? There we go. Excuse me, I just uh, lost my mouse there for a minute. Okay, so this, uh, this was unacceptable to most Scottish peoples, and they were eventually forced from their farms where they had lived and worked for many centuries. This time was known as the Highland Clearances, and many Scottish families looked for better opportunities. A man named Thomas Douglas would present one of these opportunities to several Scottish families. So who was Lord Selkirk? The man known as Lord Selkirk was Thomas Douglas. He was a Scottish philanthropist who sponsored immigrant settlements in Canada. He was born on June 20th, 1771, and was the seventh son of Dunbar Douglas, who was the fourth Earl of, of Selkirk, and his wife, Helen Hamilton. Thomas Douglas attended the Palgrave Academy in Suffolk for his early education and went on to University of Edinburgh to study to become a lawyer. It was during this time that the Highland Clearances were taking place and he noticed the plight of the poor Scottish crofters who were being displaced by their landlords. He wished to find a way to help these people find new lands to settle in the British colonies in North America. In 1799, after his father's death, he became the fifth Earl of Selkirk. 
when Thomas unexpectedly inherited the Selkirk title and estates, he used his new money and political connections to purchase lands in Canada where he could settle poor Scottish farmers and their families. Land was purchased in Belfast, Prince Edward Island, near Lake St. Clair in Upper Canada, and eventually in the Red River Valley in what is now Manitoba. It is the story of the Baldoon settlement in Upper Canada that I am interested in telling as it was the beginning of settlement in this area. In 1803, Lord Selkirk, Lord Selkirk was able to gather up 15 families from the Isle of Mull region in Scotland, willing to take the journey to his new settlement in Upper Canada. The journey was delayed for one year due to the Napoleonic Wars, which would have made the crossing more perilous. And as you can see, there's the map of the Isle of Mull, uh, where most of these uh, families were, were settled to begin with and were, were uh, farmers uh, uh, for different uh, landowners. And this here is a map of Scotland showing the different places where they had to travel to. Uh, the Isle of Mull on the top left corner, uh, Kirkwood Bright, which was uh, Lord Selkirk's estate down at the bottom of the page, and uh, some of the other cities that they would have had to travel through in order to uh, make this journey. So it is the, the story of the Baldoon settlement, or pardon me, I think I skipped something here. Yeah. Uh, it is the story of the Baldwin settlement in Upper Canada that I'm interested in telling uh, as it was the beginning of the settlement in the story in this area. And I think I've already uh, mentioned that. Yes, uh, pardon me. During this delay, the families worked on Selkirk's estate in Kirkudbright, which as you see at the bottom of the page, uh, until a ship could be readied for the trip in 1804. Keep in mind that these immigrants had very little to take with them. A few am family heirlooms and some clothing and other necessities that could be carried in a trunk or two was all they had. The heads of the 15 families that made the journey are listed below. And you'll see some of their professions, list professions listed beside it and where they were actually from. So we have Angus MacDonald was a printer from Glasgow, uh, Donald MacDonald, a tailor from Tyree, and so on and so forth down the list. Uh, we have Peter MacDonald was a school teacher. And some of these will just show that they're farmers and uh, the, uh, the part of the country that they came from. Now the next two slides, uh, this is a list that we have posted in the, uh, the Baldoon Settlement section of the, the museum in Wallaceburg. And it shows the complete list of passenger names and ages uh, as they were listed on that board. The oldest being 50 years old and the youngest at three months old. And many of those family names are still around in this area. And a lot of the streets and stuff are also listed. Now here I've, I've listed as well that uh, some of the original settlers we have found that are buried in this area. Uh, Hector Brown, uh, who is buried in the uh, Brown Cemetery, which is uh, basically just a, a piece of brush right now. Uh, near Port Lambton. Uh, I uncovered that stone a couple of years ago um, and it is still, hopefully it's still there. Hector McLean is buried in the Riverview Cemetery.
Okay, when uh, when travel conditions were finally favorable, uh, the 15 tra families uh, traveled from Kirkcaldy and then to Tobermory, Scotland, where they boarded the ship Uton of Greenock in May of 1804, and they set sail across the Atlantic Ocean. The voyage took five weeks, arriving at Lachine, Quebec on July 19th, 19, 1804, where the passengers were disembarked and traveled by carts to a point above the Lachine Rapids. Now, as you can see, the, uh, the Uten was not a very large ship, about 100 feet in length and about 18 feet wide. There's not much information found about its layout, size, or accommodations, but it was li not likely set up with very many cabins. So families would have had to share a, a rather small space. Also consider that a five week journey with over 102 passengers or men, women and children would require a good supply of provisions as well as such as water and food and whatever the settlers had with them for cargo. The weather, the weather as well would have been unpredictable and could range from violent storms to calm seas with no wind to drive the sails. Uh, seasickness and the possibility of other diseases were a constant worry and added to the misery on such a journey. This was certainly not a pleasant experience for many of these travelers. Uh, imagine the joy and celebration at the sight of land after five weeks on the ocean. There was one child that died at sea during the voyage, and that was 10-year-old uh, Robert Buchanan, son of John and Catherine. After arriving in Lachine, Quebec, they had to continue their journey. This was only about the halfway point for their trip. They were taken by carts to a point upriver to get by the rapids, where they would board long flat bottom boats called bateaux for their journey to Kingston. And this slide shows a picture of what a bateau was like. Uh, it ranged in size from 20 to 50 feet and would have to be paddled or could use a sail or a mast uh, on a small mast to get them by. But for the most part, the settlers themselves would have had to, to paddle these boats uh, on their journey. In Kingston, they were met with Lord, they met with Lord Selkirk, Lionel Johnson and his family, and a large number of Merino sheep. They were shipped over from New York. The settlers boarded a boat bound for Queenston on the Niagara River. Now the boat they traveled on in this part was a, a fairly decent sailing ship. And the trip took uh, about three days and was a fairly pleasant trip. The sheep were driven overland to Baldoon by Lionel Johnson and company. From Queenston, the party and all of their supplies were taken by land to a place above the Niagara Falls and once again boarded bateau to take them along the north shore of Lake Erie to Amherstburg. Although I believe before this they made a short stop at Fort Erie to, to rest before they, uh, before they traveled further. The final leg of the journey would be on open boats up the Detroit River and across Lake St. Clair to their destination of the Baldoon Farm on the Chanel Cart, arriving on September 5th, 1805, 1804, pardon me. Now that was all stuff that was taken from different texts and books uh, that I've gone through, but I wanna think about how they actually traveled uh, and how long it would have taken over many of these, uh, these distances. At Lachine, Quebec, their voyage was only half over 
as they still had to travel up the St. Lawrence and through the Great Lakes. This was done, as I said, by bateaux, which were small open boats, 25 to 50 feet in length, propelled by oars or sails to take them over the water. They would also need to travel by land in some places to get them past the rapids, both at Lachine, Quebec, and then at Niagara Falls. Now, how many bateaux were needed to carry 102 passengers and all of their cargo? Unfortunately, I could not find the answer to that question, but seeing the picture of a bateau, uh, we can guess there were several. There's not much information available that describes their journey. So again, we have to imagine for ourselves how this was done and what the travelers had to endure. Records state that after departing, de disembarking at Lachine, they were loaded onto carts and carried them past to carry them past the Lachine Rapids. Clearing the rough water, they would load onto bateau, carry them to Kingston. How long did this take? The distance of this part of the trip was about 275 kilometers. How far can you travel in a bateau each day? I looked up the average speed uh, for a kayak is between 15 to 30 kilometers per day, depending on your ex experience. So assuming that they traveled about 20 kilometers a day, this would be a two week trip just to get them through that first stage. Naturally, they would have to stop overnight along the shore to rest and when there was bad weather. Uh, I imagine that the rivers and Great Lakes were also a busy plate, busy travel spot, even in 1804. Okay, let me go to the next one here. There we go. Uh, the settlers arrived at Lachine on July 19th, 1804, and arrived at Baldoon on September 5th, 1804. This meant that this part of the trip took approximately eight weeks to travel the 1,040 kilometers. This means that they traveled an average of 20, 21 to 25 kilometers per day, allowing for one to two weeks stay at both Amherstburg and Fort Erie. And as you can see on this old map that I have up here, Montreal and Lachine, Quebec, were up in this area here, and they would have had to travel down the St. Lawrence River to Kingston for their first leg of the journey. After that, they were on the sailing ship to take them from Kingston to Queenston, which is along the Niagara River. And from that point, they, got, they traveled by cart over to the upper part of Niagara Falls. And from what I've heard, they stayed at Lake uh, at Fort Erie for a, a week or so. From there, traveling along the north shore of Lake Erie, they traveled around to Amherstburg by what is now Detroit. And they stayed there for about a week. After that, they traveled up to St. Clair in open boats and managed to get to the Baldoon Settlement, which is at the north end of Lake St. Clair on the Sny River. Meanwhile, with the settlers on their way across the Atlantic, uh, Lord Selkirk all was already in New England crossed at Niagara into Upper Canada. On May 30th, 1804, he began to make his way overland to the Baldoon settlement in order to make the site ready for the settlers. They arrived at Baldoon around the 7th of June and began making arrangements to have buildings erected at the Baldoon site before the settlers arrived. Lord Selkirk had Alexander McDonnell act as a farm manager for the site.
Now, this map shows the Baldoon Farm situated along the Sny River in Dover Township. Okay, we'll stay with that one for a minute. Now, word was sent back to New York and Queenston to start driving the herds of sheep to Baldoon. Lord Selkirk also made arrangements to have two houses built, one for the workers that were on site and the other for Peter MacDonald, who was in charge of the settlers, as well as a barn for the animals. 14 small houses were to be built but the barn was first priority. Lord Selkirk thought that the settlers would have had at least two months before the cold weather set in and could manage with temporary shelter. So he was hoping that the settlers themselves would have been able to build uh, their own houses when they arrived at the site. Now, Lord Selkirk left Baldoon for Sandwich, which was Windsor, on July the 9th leaving the farm in the hands of Alexander MacDonald to prepare for the new arrivals. Selkirk remained in Sandwich until July 27th, where he got estimates to construct several buildings at Baldoon, including a mill and a distillery. Other arrangements were made to supply extra food and animals, such as beef, oxen, and ewes from Detroit to help with the settlers' arrival the first to help the settlers survive the first winter. Lord Selkirk, satisfied with the set that the settlement was well underway and ready for the 15 families, left Baldoon to meet the travelers at Kingston. Now, the, the 15 families, they arrived at Baldoon on September the 5th, 1804. The land they had left behind in, in in Scotland were rocky were rolly rock <laughs> rolling rocky hills and meager soil of the Scottish Highlands. Their new home was flat open meadows and rich fertile soil. There was an abundance of trees and forests throughout the area and a lot of game and fish that they could uh, survive on. Although much of the settlement was on low lying marshy land, it was thought with proper drainage, it could become excellent farmland. And that there is the Merino sheep that they had imported from Scotland. In, I believe the first bunch that they brought over was about, about 5,000 sheep to bring over land from New York over Niagara Falls and uh, overland to the Baldoon settlement. Now, as I said, the, the Baldoon settlement was mostly swampy land. And they found that when the water was high, it was infested with malaria borne mosquitoes, uh, which took the lives of many of the settlers. Now, go back to this one for a minute here. Uh, trouble soon began. Firstly, the location of the settlement was prone to periodic flooding and the wet marshy areas were excellent breeding ground for the mosquitoes. The incessant rains that year raised the river levels, which left much of the land in and around the, the settlement underwater. Fever soon began to spread, and many of the settlers were too weak from illness and their long voyage, that new houses could not be built before winter set in. They had to make do with makeshift shelters and tents, which only added to their misery. Oh, pardon me, wrong mouse. By early November in 1804, 14 of the original settlers had died with the number expected to increase. Although the fever was generally believed to be caused by the bad air around swampy and decaying vegetation in poorly drained land, 
it was in fact the mosquito that caused malaria to spread. Crops that had been sown by the workers before the arrival of the settlers in early spring, or before the arrivals of the settlers, but summer months, but the late summer month rains and the rising water levels flooded much of the crop that had been planted. The two houses that were built before the arrival were also flooded and unusable. Another problem that plagued the settlement were Selkirk's choice of Alexander McDonald as, farmer, as farm manager. Uh, Mr. McDonald spent little time at Baldoon and was away to York, Toronto, much of the time seeking higher office. <clears throat> he did report to Selkirk about the poor conditions at the settlement and that higher ground should be sought. Communication was slow during this time, and since the higher position that Mr. McDonald was seeking did not come about, he decided to put more effort into helping the settlement thrive. So the messages that he sent to Lord Selkirk, requesting that they be moved to higher ground, wouldn't have gotten to Lord Selkirk for, for at least a month or so. So this time, he or Lord or Mr. McDonald decided to try to help out the settlers as best he could at that location. But once he did hear back from Lord Selkirk, suggesting that they move to a higher, higher ground, uh, Mr. McDonald decided not to go ahead with that and stay where they were at. Alexander made the uh, poor selections of managers to replace him on his long stays at York, which caused much problems and disagreement among the settlers. His reports back to Lord Selkirk often blamed his replacements instead of his own shortcomings. He had also disregarded Selkirk's instructions to relocate the settlers to either the Forks, which is Wallsburg's present location, or to upriver of the Lake St. Clair River. Selkirk would instruct MacDonald to move the settlement on to other locations over the next several years, but again, MacDonald overruled his instructions. Now, the Baldoon settlement would stay where it was and would su suffer more hardships throughout the next several years. Malaria would strike again, and by November 1805, 22 settlers had died, including eight of the original 15 heads of family. The sheep and crops also suffered these early years. In spring 1805, many sheep suffered from scab, resulting in several losses. Rattlesnakes, rattlesnakes and wolf packs also took their toll on the sheep. Crops failed in 1804 due to extremely wet conditions, and again in 1805, but due to drought. So it seems that even Mother Nature was not on their side. They fought it out for many years, still trying to make do with what they had there, and uh, some of it wasn't too bad. But then again, the war in 1812 would also deal a harsh blow. For the settlers, as American troops raided the Baldoon and took many of the animals, crops, and other supplies they could carry. Then again, in 1804, in, uh, pardon me, in October 1814, the settlement was raided by American General MacArthur. After all the hardships, a lot of the settlers eventually moved on to different locations. And then on September 18th, 1818, Lord Selkirk finally sold the farm for about $2,225 to John McNabb. And as I said, most of the original settlers had already moved to higher ground at the Forks or at other nearby locations.
Now the slide here is a is a map of Wallaceburg as it was back in 18, 1866. The first official residence of Wallaceburg was Laughlin McDougall, who was the son of John and Sarah McDougall. In about 1822, he bought lot 13 on the second concession, which if you find my mouse here was this, this location here. He put up a multi-purpose building to be used as a trading post, a traver, tra tavern, and a dwelling place. The building was situated where the Legion now sits. Soon after, more Baldoon settlers bought uh, land around the Forks, and in 1834, Hugh McCallum became the first po postmaster and gave Wallaceburg its name. Before that period, the Wallaceburg was known as either the Forks or, for some reason, uh, was called the Forty Thieves. I haven't quite figured out why yet. Now, the Baldoon settlement was, was considered a failure at the time, but many of the settlers that we were, were left eventually came to the Forks to start the foundations of what would be Wallaceburg. The Baldoon name survives throughout town, as does several of the original family names. The original families of the Baldoon settlement and their descendants, although suffering great losses during the early years, did eventually prosper and spread throughout Southern Ontario and were a major stepping stone in the development of Wallaceburg. And as you can see, the Wallaceburg name or the Baldoon name and some of the settlers and Selkirk himself are listed on several of the streets and buildings around town. So uh, this is about the end of my presentation. I, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, hopefully it'll answer a few of your questions that you might have had about the Baldoon settlement and we're able to uh, think of what it was like 220 years ago in this area. And uh, just one more item here before we end this. Uh, I did find recently a, uh, a document, a letter that I believe was written by Lord Selkirk uh, talking about what was needed for the Baldoon settlement um, before the settlers arrived. And I'm just going to bring a part of that up. This was a handwritten letter, and I haven't quite deciphered or uh, transcribed all of it yet. But uh, some of the items that they, they talk about here are, are the sheep which were supposed to be a staple article um, for which uh, the first line there stating sheep are to be considered as the staple article on which the profit of the farm will be chiefly dependent, may be extended more than any other article of cultivation and will, bet, will pay better. So he is talking a lot about uh, making a profit on whatever he does on this farm. And he's got some expenses and uh, profits of what he could, what he thought could be done with the, with the farm itself. And on the next page here, it does say that uh, they would like to, to bring the uh, the total number of sheep to around ten to fifteen thousand in this area if they could find enough wintering uh, pastures for them. And this letter goes on. I'm not sure exactly uh, who the letter was supposedly sent to, but it does describe what they what they had hoped to do with the water problem, uh, digging ditches, bringing in cattle, and uh, where did, what crops would be grown. Uh, here they're talking about turnips, potatoes, carrots, and other root vegetables along with the wheat and the grains that they would have to plant for the uh, for the sheep's, uh, sheep themselves. And then further down, they talk about buying the horses, uh, some cattle, some um, 
and other uh, other animals that they might need. Uh, 20, 20 cows of the best breed. Uh, and he just describes a lot of what, the, what they would need uh, for the farm. So this is one of the letters that I've been trying to transcribe uh, back at the museum. And I've been finding it quite interesting. It would be really interesting to know who it was actually uh, meant for. Because uh, parts of the, uh, the letter are missing. So I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, what I've had here tonight. Um, I know I have a, a, a really good time looking through all of the information and uh, trying to make heads or tails of what they've what they've got. And uh, I hope you have uh, as big of an interest in, in the Baldwin settlement as I do. So thank you very much. And I will turn this back over to Cindy, unless uh, somebody else has any questions uh, that they'd like to bring up. I'd uh, be, uh, we'll try to answer as much as I can. Although I'm still researching a lot of what uh, what we have at the museum. So Henry, I don't know if I missed your first sentence about this letter. Was there a date on the letter? No, there was no actual date. Okay. Uh, but from what I've read, it sounds like it was from before the, the arrival of the settlers. And is this letter something that's available for people to view at the museum or is it like put away archived? It, it is something that we we can review at the at the uh, museum. I have both the original letter scanned and the transcription of of what I can read of it uh, listed with it as well. Okay, Angela, are there any questions? Uh, just a couple. Um, you had a couple of maps up of the old Baldoon settlement and one later from Wallaceburg. Are they available somewhere? Where did you pull them from? Uh, this, the, the map that I have up here, it's listed in several of our, several of our books um, that we do have at the museum. And we do have them also scanned and uh, on our computer at the museum for people to come out and look at. Uh, if they're doing research projects on the, uh, on the Baldwin settlement, uh, we can show them where these are all at. Uh, we are in the process of trying to digitize as much as we can, and we'll have to try to organize and, and catalog it a little bit better so that they're easy easy to find. But yeah, some of these uh, maps I have pulled up off of the uh, off the uh, computer, uh, like this one here. Uh, it was just an old map that I, I dug up off of the uh, internet. And I don't know if they're, oh, these ones here I also took off the internet to uh, to add to my slideshow. But yeah, some of these uh, we do have at the museum. And uh, if you're interested in coming out sometime to do a little bit of research, we'd be uh, more than like more than happy to, to help you out. Awesome. Um, now you had a poster of the original settlers at the Baldoon settlement, the list of names. Do you have any further family history on each of these families? included somewhere? Yes, we do have uh, some of the information uh, and we have, we are trying to uh, add to that. We do have some of the family histories, uh, genealogies from some of these families going forward, uh, probably a good 100 or 200 years to um, almost the present. Uh, so some of these I've been going through and trying to figure out uh, what happened to most of them, who was actually buried at the Baldwin site, and if they, uh, where the other ones ended up. Uh, I know some were up uh, along Fort Lambton, where the Baldwin mystery took place. Uh, they were actually uh, original Baldwin settlers that uh, ended up in, in Port Lambton at the time. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out if there was any of the actual Baldwin settlers that have been moved to the uh, Riverview Cemetery as well, because I know um, there is there was an original Baldoon Cemetery uh, on the Baldoon settlement. Uh, it's been pretty difficult to find out exactly where it is, but it's just an open it's just a, a field right now, so it's it's hard to find. 
Um, some of them ended up in the, uh, the early settlers uh, cemetery here in town on Water Street. And once that cemetery was, was dismantled, it was all moved to um, Riverview Cemetery. So there are some settlers that are actually buried out there uh, at the Riverview Cemetery. Uh, but I think a lot of the originals would have been buried at the Baldwin Settlement and are just um, an open field. Now, would Lord Selkirk have taken on all the costs for everything, like sh the ships across, all, all the food, everything for all the settlers the whole trip? Yes, uh, he would have uh, paid for all of that, hoping to make it back uh, from the farms that he, um, from the settlements that he had uh, initiated. Um, the one in Baldoon uh, actually didn't turn out very well. Uh, the Red River Valley in uh, Alberta. Uh, I think it did a little bit better, although there was a lot of problems with the uh, um, the Hudson Bay Company, I believe it was, um, and the uh, the hunters for the for the beaver pelts. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how the one in uh, Prince Edward Island ended up. But yeah, one. they all had difficulties and then Selkirk pretty much um, didn't end up making much money on it at all and eventually died in, uh, I believe, I had it stated, died in, in 1920. Yeah, we had one comment that said, uh, from Mary, that said her family went to Belfast PEI where there was a successful settlement. Yes, yeah, I think that was one of the, the more successful ones. I know the other two, the, uh, the Baldoon, although it was stated to be a failure, it still brought a lot of Scottish settlers to the area and opened up the, uh, the area here for them. Uh, the one in uh, the Red River Valley uh, also had problems. Uh, like I said, and uh, I don't know how well that one actually did. There's lots of thank yous and very interesting talks in the comments for you, Henry, um, especially, you know, sharing how tough the, the trip was for these people and what they had to, you know, go through in order to try and make their lives here. So that's yeah, that. it's, and... it's really interesting to to try to understand what it was like back in that in those days. Uh, there was nobody else around. They had to cut their uh, all the trees down in the area in order to make a, a, a farm for themselves. And then, like I said, the, the troubles that they had with this actual uh, settlement, with the low water that they had. And when Lord Selkirk had uh, reviewed this area in 1803, uh, the water levels were fairly low. So it, they, they came back to a big surprise when uh, everything was flooded uh, back in 1804. Um, another question was whether the settlers would have to uh, transport or portage their bateau overland. Yes, they in depending on what areas that we're at, uh, for the most part over the the St. Lawrence, uh, they were uh, escorted um, by people with the the carts and the wagons. Uh, they wouldn't have had to carry their bateau because that was already ranged up river to have bateau waiting for them. And I think the same situation would have been over uh, over the Niagara Falls area. Uh, they would just have to have gone onto carts with all their supplies and the families, and they would have been carried to uh, to probably Fort Erie at the time, and would have boarded other boats to carry them uh, the rest of the way. So they they didn't really have to portage with the boats, just with their cargo and, and the, the personnel. Um, Duff McDonald wonders if any of his McDonald or any of these McDonald's from the settlement ended up in Glencoe. Would you know that? Uh, you I haven't gone over the, uh, the genealogies yet uh, as far as where they everybody had gone to. So it, it is quite possible. I think a lot of the families that were in this area do show up in in other uh, sections of, of Ontario as well. 
And there's an offer by uh, Cameron to share information on the McCallums if anyone's interested. And he has maybe some more information on the Selkirk letters if you're interested. That would be very good. Uh, if uh, he can just uh, get a hold of us at the, at the Wallsburg Museum uh, by email, uh, that would be great. Uh, or to myself at uh, Henry Van Heeren at hotmail.ca. Uh, I can uh, follow up on that and uh, see what we have relating to those, uh, those genealogies. Okay, I think yeah, that's it, sound, it for it questions. Sounds like, it sounds like Cameron's maybe has some uh, some experience, so he might be a great person. Or she says, my husband and I have yeah. read one of <laughs> Selkirk's letters and may be able to assist with some of those difficult handwriting words. So you might have a, an offer. <laughs> yep, that would be great. Uh, I've tried to uh, decipher some. I've just actually gotten started with the one letter. And uh, it, it there are some tricky parts to it. And... Uh, I could I could use whatever help I can get, and then I can also take take a look at what we have on the genealogies for their families and uh, and see how far it goes on our side. Great, I'm actually writing it their email down so that I can send it to you. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure if we're gonna say. I think we get to save the chat too, and I could forward the chat to you as well. But just in case, yes. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah, because I also have uh, somebody coming over from BC this summer to uh, look at. A lot of the information that we have, uh, I think it's related to uh, Angus McDonald that he wants to go over and he wants to take a look at maybe the uh, the original Baldwin settlement site as well. Although right now it's just the uh, farmer's fields. So. Right. <laughs> well, if it's a McDonald, maybe Duff has a, a, a connection there, too. So Duff is actually quite active on our Facebook uh, group yeah, as well. So I, if you wanted to connect with him, that might be an uh, opportunity as well. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of recall the name before from uh, Duff McDonald. So okay. uh, I may have already talked to him uh, at one point or another. Right. Although my memory is so bad, I, I couldn't couldn't say for sure. <laughs> so you might have already touched it, but one of my questions was um, uh, if people do have material or photographs or they have information on those 15 families, um, I'm sure you would be interested so as you said, maybe email the museum if they're willing to share with you so that you can add to that, um, you know, the folders or whatever you're creating for each one of these families and we can get more information about them. So if anyone has any information or is connected, uh, definitely reach out to Henry at the Wallsburg Museum. And uh, yeah, we would certainly anything. love to add it to the to the genealogies of, uh, of all those families and find out where they ended up or uh, um, how they how they related to the to the original families. Great. So it'd be really interesting to uh, to put more and more of this together. Wonderful. Um, Barbara says Brian Anderson, pastor in Wallsburg, has done research on Alan McLean family. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. No, I don't think I've heard of that yet. But uh, oh, okay. I do think that we do have a a, a genealogy on the the McLean family, I think, from the Baldoon settlement. So that may already be part of our uh, our information, but uh, if not, then I, I'd certainly like to get a hold of it. Great. Yeah, so we will save the chat and we'll, uh, we'll send it over to you as well. Um, Angela, are there any other questions? Nope, that looks to be everything. Lots of thank yous and very interesting though, Henry. And I enjoyed okay. it myself, it was great. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you very much. Yes, you did great for your first time. <laughs> yeah, I hopefully, uh, yeah, I think we used up most of our time. So that's, that's, that's good. I didn't hear any questions during, but uh, I'm glad we got some questions at the end there to, to answer. And hopefully I'll uh, dig up some more information as time goes on. Com. I'm just writing down Duff's uh, email and I'll forward that to you as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for spending your Friday night with us, even though it was a beautiful Friday night. And most people probably were going, ah, do I want to go and watch? But it was well worth it. Thank you so much. Like I said, you did wonderful for your first time. Um, I know it's uh, it's a little bit daunting and can you know, you can get uh, a little bit nervous, but you did great. And uh, hopefully once you uh, 
maybe fill up all those folders about all those 15 families with all their genealogies. Maybe you'll come back on again and share what you found with us. That, that will be something new. And we would like that. Yeah, and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll get some more practice in. <laughs> Absolutely. So everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're able and you're near Chatham in May, please join us for our in-person presentation. So we'll say goodnight to everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, thanks, Colleen, for starting the meeting and Angela for monitoring the chat. So good night, everyone. And, and uh, have a great be weekend. before we disappear, Cindy, yeah. uh, could, I, could I mention, too, uh, we are having a couple of events at the Wallsburg Museum, and one of yeah. them will be the, uh, the Baldoon Days which will also be a, a, a little bit of a history lesson uh, about the Baldwin Settlement area. And that'll be uh, September the 16th. Great. So if anybody's interested in, in joining us uh, that day, uh, we'd appreciate it. Okay. So that information's on the website as well? Yes, it on the, will be on the website as well, yes. Okay, perfect. So if they didn't catch all that, then we can do that. So thanks again, sure. everyone, and have a great night. Enjoy your weekend. Good night. Okay, good night. Thank you. Thanks.